Uh, here they come, Grace. The room is filling up. Welcome, welcome. I feel like we should have virtual prizes. If we did, um, first prize would go to Gillian McNulty, who is the first to arrive. Oh, well, <laughs> there you go. I didn't think it was a race, but there you Mostly go. Mostly followed by Dom. <laughs> so lots more people coming across the virtual doormat. We'll just let the room fill up for a bit before we start things formally. But welcome. Oh, Gillian's actually quite excited about being the first in. So there you go. That's good. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, head on over to the chat. Let us know what's on your mind when it comes to trust right now. Why you're here. Um, feel free to let us know where you're joining us from whether that's what organization you're joining us from or what geographical location or just what location within your house or office. Yeah, shed, attic, back garden, sun lounger, in, on the lawn or in the actual office, Ooh. maybe in a coffee shop, on a train, who knows, but there you go. Don says it's sunny in Wood Green. I'm presuming that's a description of the today's situation in Wood Green, not its official all the time name. We shall see. Both, says Dom. Dom's also a really fast typer as well, which is fantastic. <laughs> Julian is in an attic. There you go. See, we're not joking. That kind of stuff is still happening as well. Hey, Teresa, in the newly kitted out home office, repurposed. Hey there to Maris uh, in Bristol. I'm not too far from Bristol. I'm up in North Somerset as well. Got people in the dining room and the office and the summer house and the bedroom, all that good stuff as well. John, in a real office with 3D human beings, how is that going? Are you all kind of staring at each other going, it's you. <laughs> I either haven't seen you for years or I actually have never met you before. <laughs> so there you go. The funniest cool. thing I found with meeting people face to face that we've only previously met online is, is height. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. you don't get a sense of people's height on a virtual space. So not particularly, but there you go. Excellent. I think we may have most of the initial rush now, Grace. Um, the room is still a few clicking in, but it might be time to uh, to get going. So take us away. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Really great to have you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, who haven't worked us with us before, uh, my name is Grace Marshall, and I'm joined by my colleague Lee. And we are both productivity ninjas. Those are that's our official job title. That's actually what it says on our business cards, on our LinkedIn profile. Lee's going to show a business card now, is he? Oh yeah, yes. there you go. So good, good stuff. Man. Well prepared as always. <laughs> and we are part of a team at Think Productive where we are on a mission to transform the way that people work. So to help people find ways of working with um, less stress and less overwhelm and more what we like to call playful productive momentum. So what we're really interested in isn't how do we get people to do more work necessarily, it's more about how do we all do our best work, have fun doing it and have a life outside of work. So if that sounds good to you, that is what we are all about. Uh, most of the time, Lee and I work within organizations. So we go and we'll rock up to your um, away days and your staff conferences and um, present some keynotes on the way of the productivity ninja. Or we might come and work with a team um, for a half day getting your inbox to zero workshops or a full day of getting your second brain set up with how to be a productivity ninja. And um, these sessions are designed to be a little bit of a mini taster and a bit of a skills booster session. So for those of you who have worked with us before, this is in addition to what you've already got from us. And for those of you who haven't worked with us before, hopefully this is an, a good sort of taster of the sort of approach that we take and the um, insights and the tips that we share. So today we're here talking about building trust in today's world of work. And this topic actually came off the back of the last Ninja Skills Booster that you did, Lee. So yours ah, was on yeah. air when you were talking about um, hybrid working. We did, um, and we had a great day that day. We did. I, I remember getting very forthright about certain things. <laughs> you did indeed, yeah. So if you missed that session, you can go and uh, watch that on our YouTube channel. Um, but the thing um, that came up in some of the questions, some of the chats of that session was, hmm, okay, how do we build trust? So maybe it's how do we build trust in a space where we maybe haven't met each other in that kind of hybrid world of working, but also some of the conversations were around, you know, checking in with each other and contact and accountability and how sometimes an attempt at accountability might come across as, 
or that feels like you don't trust me if you're trying to hold me accountable. And so it felt like that this was a topic that's worth exploring a little bit more. And we have various sessions that kind of feed into this topic. So what I've done today is just pull together a few thoughts and ideas and insights from some of those sessions to um, to pull together you know, some, some insights for you to take away, but also just to start the conversation and to hear from you as well. So this is how it's gonna go roughly. Um, yeah, we'll look at why trust matters, but also why now, why trust matters now more than, maybe more than ever. Um, and then we'll, we'll share some ideas with you around building trust, but also I'm keen to hear from you in terms of what do other people do to earn your trust? Um, what do you do to try and build trust? Because I think um, you know, a lot of this is we can learn from each other as well. So why trust? Well, we're big fans of it, aren't we, Lee? <laughs> oh yes, makes life so much easier, <laughs> much um, smoother. In fact, it's even part of our values. So it's one of our values is that trust and kindness are our rocket fuel. That's how we feel about it. And um, yeah, so it's it's safe to say we are big fans of trust. And it matters because trust affects our motivation and it affects our engagement. And our engagement is often the biggest thing that, that improves a whole load of stuff. So as you can see here, loyalty, trust increases loyalty, whether that's customer loyalty, but also loyalty to each other within an organization, within a team, also loyalty with our suppliers, with our stakeholders. And that loyalty goes both ways as well. When we feel trusted, um, you know, it's easier to get stuff done in an environment of high trust. So our productivity increases as well. And it also improves the work life experience. We enjoy working in environments of high trust with and with people we trust. So no wonder staff turnover goes down as well. Um, and then of course that, that leads through to the bottom line as well, because when we feel trusted, it fuels our commitment, our motivation, our drive, our energy. We can get behind things that we are much more. And you know, and, and that has an economic benefit to it as well. So you know, we find that actually when there's low trust there's a lot of friction. It slows everything down and it increases cost. It becomes more costly, takes longer to get anything done. And of course, the opposite is true as well. When we've got high trust, it speeds things up and you know, it reduces the cost of getting things done. Stephen Covey talks about this as a trust tax or a trust dividend. So if you've got low trust, you're paying a trust tax there. Things are costing more. Um, but if you've got high trust, it pays off like a dividend. Um, and these are some of the things that you know, come from our leading hybrid teams and it's some of the things that you know, have come up in conversation when we've been working with leaders and managers on how do we lead in this kind of new world of hybrid working. This is normally an exercise we do where we get people thinking about which ones of these do we relate to more um, we're not going to do that exercise today, but you can use it to reflect, you know, do I notice more of those high trust behaviors within my workplace? Or do I notice some of those low trust behaviors within my workplace? So when we've got high trust, we tend to talk straight. Yeah, we tend to say what we mean um, and do what we say as well. Whereas when we have low trust, we might find there's a little bit of hedging our bets, being a little bit more cagey, maybe double talking, maybe thinking, oh, I can't say it that way. I've got to say it a different way. Um, yeah, so there's that costs in itself, doesn't it? Yeah, there's a certain amount of work involved in doing that. Um, but also there's a difference in focus when it comes to high trust and low trust. Um, you know, in terms of low trust, we tend to focus on delivering activities. It's like, look at how many emails I've sent. Look at how many meetings I'm going to. Whereas in a high trust environment, we might be more focused on delivering results. And that's also where some of that, those productivity benefits come from. I know which one I'd like to be in. I'm looking, I'm looking to see if there's reactions in the chat to green list and red list, but maybe, maybe we're just all of the same mind. <laughs> I think it's a really good diagnosis though, as well as pointing us to the, towards the importance. Love it. Yeah, definitely. And then this is what sits behind a lot of those behaviors. So I think none of us looked through that red list and went, yeah, that's what I want to do. But I think maybe sometimes we can recognize where we might fall into that trap. And the reason why we might fall into that trap, it comes down to a lot to our lizard brain. So our lizard brain is a primitive part of our brain that is responsible for keeping us alive. And it does that by activating the fight or flight stress response. Problem is it doesn't differentiate between physical threat and a social threat. Because back in the day when we all lived in caves, um, yeah, they were one and the same. If you get rejected from the tribe, 
you can't survive on your own. So a social threat is a life-threatening situation, or it was back then. Nowadays, if we don't feel safe around each other, if we don't feel like we trust each other, then our lizard brain is going to be busy trying to put in place self-protection mechanisms or maybe self-promotion mechanisms. Because the other thing that happens with lizard brain is it goes, oh, everything's a competition. It's survival of the fittest. So actually, I need to make sure I'm the one that comes out on top. We might you know, think in that sort of scarcity and competition mode rather than necessarily collaboration mode. That makes the work a lot harder as well. Those of you who have worked with us before may recognize this slide. It it's my favorite slide in all it of is, the decks. It? It's the best <laughs> <laughs> and we usually use the slide to talk about the cognitive load. So brain overload, like we've got far too much to do. It's all in a mess in our heads. And if you look at each one of those things, it's not just something to do with, it's usually some thinking involved, some decision making involved. Now imagine if all of those post-it notes had an emotional load involved as well. Because if we're in a low trust environment, it often does. It's like book a meeting room. Hang on a minute, who's going to nick my meeting room? Um, or if I don't trust the system, is it going to actually hold? Or is someone else going to turn up in the middle of my meeting saying, we've got this room booked? And that seems like a silly example. But actually, if you start you know, looking at, if I don't trust, you know, if I need to get back to my boss, what does that look like? It might not be a simple email. There might be a lot of stuff going on in my mind in terms of how do I need to put it? Um, so this is what happens is that we increase our emotional load um, when there's a low trust environment as well. John's put a really good uh, thought on that in the chat, Grace. Um, mm. John says, this is so strong. The vulnerability of transparency and authenticity are built on a foundation of trust. And so we behave really differently if we can trust and feel trusted. So um, John, John's, John's on our on our, on our our line here when it comes to the importance of trust first. And that idea that we behave differently in the presence or the absence of trust, I think that's really strong there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so important to build you know, trust, because building a culture of trust is a key component to building psychological safety. And when we don't have psychological safety within our teams, we're going to start seeing each other as a threat, or there's a potential that we will start seeing each other as a threat. And when that happens, our attention and our focus can't be solely focused on the work, because part of our attention and our focus will be focused on protecting ourselves. Am I safe to say that? Am I okay doing that? You know, I've asked that person to do it, but are they actually gonna deliver? And so we go into that sort of battle mode or avoidance mode or defensiveness. You know, our lizard brain goes into vigilance mode and that not only takes up you know, attention and energy, it can also create a lot more work. Because imagine an email trail where nobody's actually saying what they mean. That's gonna end up getting, you know- Yeah, that's not gonna help. <laughs> no, it's not, is it? <laughs> Yeah. So what we find is that when we have psychological safety as a team, as an organization, um, what we find is we have um, free discussions, open discussions, honest discussions, uh, low friction discussions. And it, as a, a result of that, we get a wider perspective as well. When people feel safe to contribute, um, then we get a diversity of thought. We get different ideas rather than just like, stay safe and, and all kind of pretend to agree with each other. And of course, the opposite is true as well. If we don't have psychological safety, there's a lot more second guessing, self censorship, maybe perfectionism as well. Like I'm not safe to make a mistake or take risk here. I have to be perfect. Um, and a lot of worry and anxiety that holds people back from doing their best work and showing up as their best selves. I know you're moving on, Grace, but you got two strong hits from Teresa and Zoe to the picture of the colleague with the post-it notes all over their face. It's, it's just so uh, a really effective depiction of what the internal environment can sometimes feel like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so why now? Why in particular is, you know, is kind of trust such a key thing at the moment? I think we've kind of got a perfect storm, really. So hybrid working or remote working over the last two years has changed the rules of engagement. So you know, things are different now. And what we saw some organizations go to is almost, oh gosh, I can't see my people. How do I know they're working? And they've almost lent more on control rather than trust. Um, and this study in particular found that, you know, when the managers in increased their need for control, they created more meetings, more monitoring, more measuring, there's more myopia. Um, in response, employees started worrying more about visibility. How do I look like I'm doing good work rather than how do I just get the good work done? 
And that led to a lot of overconnection, over communication, which resulted in reduced impact and increased stress. So our productivity dropped, our results dropped, and our stress increased. Nowadays, we've got the whole hybrid working debate. And you know, there are some organizations, some leaders who are being quite vocal about saying, I want everyone back in the office. You know, if you're not in the office, then you're pretending to work. Um, and if you work for organizations like that, I'm gonna guess that that's a pretty low trust environment. But even if you don't, with that rhetoric happening in the background, some of us might start worrying about some of that visibility and what other people might be thinking, what our, you know, what our bosses, what our leaders might be thinking. The other thing that's happening is we've got dispersed teams. So we are you know, working maybe with people we haven't met in person. And, you know, and that's a challenge as well, because it's harder to get to know each other um, and to develop that trust when we haven't spent as much time together. Recruitment and retention. So we mentioned earlier, I think it was at 40% um, you know, on, on retention, impact on retention where we've got highly engaged employees. And what we're finding at the moment, at least what I'm hearing a lot of is that there's a recruitment crisis going on. And some organizations are responding in a way of trying to match that by increasing salaries. But actually, there comes a point where we can't keep competing on increasing salaries. That's unsustainable. How do we do that? And actually, you know, one of the things that um, I was in conversation with uh, some consultants on recently who were talking about this was, what if we started competing on care rather than competing on price? Um, because let's face it, an increased salary might attract us to a job or an organization, but actually what keeps us there is, how does it feel to work here? Do I feel like I'm contributing and my work is valued? Do I feel like I'm valued here? You know, do I enjoy the people I work with? Do I feel like I'm making a difference? Those are the, often the things. Do I feel like I'm looked after, that the, you know, the people care for me here? I've Those certainly are... noticed, Grace, that conversation is a lot on a lot more people's minds, not just recruiter staff within organisations, but, but team members. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the new perspective that the last couple of gears have given us, um, different things are on our mind now when it comes to creating that relationship with an employer and connecting that to lifestyle as well. Uh, I know you have some more to say about this slide and the next one, but we already have one discussion question queued up for the next time that you invite some uh, some thoughts from the from the panel. Yeah. Please carry on. Brilliant. OK, um, I'm not going to look at the chat right now because otherwise I'm going to get distracted. <laughs> um, yeah, and the final thing I'll say on this is uncertainty. So when uncertainty in general is high, I think it has a generalized effect on trust. So I would say I'm quite a trusting person. But I've noticed that when I'm feeling uncertain, that lizard brain you know, is more sensitive. It might, you know, I start kind of worrying a bit more. I start getting a bit more defensive. So I think that's a really natural reaction to uncertainty. And given that we've just been through two years of a pandemic and things are still uncertain now, we've got you know, fuel shortage, you know, supply chain crisis, other things, big things happening in the rest of the world. You know, there's a, still a lot of uncertainty going on. So that will have an effect on um, how much trust we feel we have um, you know, in, in, in life in general, let alone in each other. So I just want to pause there and see you know, what's resonating with you. What um, do you recognize maybe in your own behavior or in others within your environment? Um, you know, and how does trust affect your productivity? So what do you find happens when you don't have trust? Um, or you know, when, when you don't feel trusted or either when you don't trust someone or something? Grace, so, while people are heading to the chat to offer those, could I um, ask you Oliver's question? Um, so this is when you were introducing the concept of psychological safety and Oliver asked, doesn't creating psychological safety require a risk to be taken on the part of an individual and or team? And that in itself is a threat. I think I think Oliver's talking about how being vulnerable can sometimes be scary. Yes. Um, and our colleague Elena has helpfully just below that in the chat, you don't need to look, um, has shared the, the internal definition of psychological safety that we use at Think Productive yes. as well. So yeah, um, being asked to be vulnerable and open is in itself a threat, I think is the issue that's on the table. Absolutely, yeah. So it's like, we can't wait until we, maybe we can't wait until we feel completely safe in order to, 
you know, because actually sometimes it's the vulnerability and that sort of thing that actually builds trust. So, so it is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, right. um, but it's also a virtuous cycle. So the more psychological safety we feel, the more you know, free we are to be vulnerable. And then the more of that psychological safety we build as well. Um, and Elena's definition um, is basically the, the definition that we use internally um, when we talk about psychological safety at Think Productive is it's a shared belief. So it's a shared belief by the team that our team environment is safe for taking interpersonal risks. Um, Me too. Talk- Sorry. Me too has offered um, an insight to that, which is that um, the emotional burden that comes with low trust it just takes up your brain and avoids you kind of being in the present and being able to focus on what you're doing. Whereas Dan's offering the, the opposite of that. When I feel trusted as I do now, it allows you to work with your own intuition and be confident that you're doing the right thing without referring to superiors consistently. I know that you've got some thoughts on that kind of thing coming in the next section. Absolutely. How many more do you want, Grace, before we move on? Uh, let's go for one more. Okay, what if someone doesn't trust themselves? Wow, I've given you a really small one there, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. So it's not just about trusting other people. It's like, do I trust myself? Mm. If we don't trust ourselves, we might end up doing a lot of second guessing. We might do, do a lot of checking. Mm. Um, actually, I'll, I'll share this one story. I remember the first, um, very early on in my career as a productivity ninja, I was invited to write an article for Productive Magazine, which was an art, you know, it, it, it's actually, it's not a magazine that's going anymore, but at the time it had, you know, David Allen and Seth Godin and people like that, you know, mm-hmm. big names. Um, and I was asked to write an article amongst these big names. And I remember sending it to Graham, who is our chief ninja, our founder, um, saying, Graham, could you check this for me? And he replied saying, are you asking me because you want me to weigh in with like how, you know, from my thick productive hat, like how does this make mm-hmm. us Or are you just experiencing some, some author insecurity right now? I was like, yeah, it's that one. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I, I totally get that sometimes it's like, I don't trust myself. So I'm like double checking, I'm asking other people for input. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we can build trust in each other to say, mm. you've got this, you know, you don't need to check with me. So just to wrap that up, I think Jane and Julian agree with you there. Um, Jane says, when you don't trust something or someone, find yourself doubling, checking and rechecking. Mm-hmm. And Julian to, enters on this discussion in a high note, says, when there is trust, it's easier to play to our strengths and admit our weaknesses to allow others to fill those spaces. Love those, both of them. I love that, particularly because it chimes so well with what we talk about on in terms of be, uh, being human, not superhero. Because superheroes have to save the world single-handedly. Another classic ninja skills session is available on the YouTube back catalogue. That was myself and Elena, that one. I enjoyed that one too. Yeah. So what kind of things can we do to build trust? So um, I find this metaphor really helpful. This comes from Brené Brown. She talks about uh, the marble jar. So the marble jar is a metaphor for trust. It's like people earn our trust one small marble at a time. It's normally not big things that people do to earn our trust. It's small things, one small gesture at a time. And the people who have earned a jar full of marbles, they have a lot of trust. Um, And if something happens where the jar tips over and a few fall out, that's okay if you've got a full jar because you've still got a lot of trust there. If you've got starting with an empty jar, it doesn't take a lot to remove trust entirely. So as I talk through the next section, um, I'd love you to be thinking about what are maybe some of those marbles for you um, or maybe what would help you to put a marble in somebody else's jar. I think it's really helpful to think of trust in two different ways. So psychologists refer to this as cognitive trust and effective trust. I find it a little bit easier to remember if I think of it as task-based trust and social trust. So task-based trust or cognitive trust is basically, do I trust this person's abilities and actions? It's like a a logical trust, it's like a head trust. Whereas effective trust or social trust is a lot more interpersonal, it's more relational. It's almost like, do I trust this person's intentions and integrity? Um, So thinking about trust in these two different ways can help us to think about what solutions, what tips, what insights might help us to build trust. So let's look at task trust first of all. Task trust is like, do I trust this person's abilities and actions? If I ask someone to do it, are they going to do it? Now, what we notice is that often lack of trust comes a lot from lack of clarity and also lack of consistency. So where there is high ambiguity, 
you've got potential for low trust. Um, so when it comes to building test trust, it, what can be really helpful are some of the things that we talk about in some of our other workshops around clarity. So um, clarity of vision, for example. Are we all clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're going to do it? Because if we're not clear about it, we're going to have different people going in different directions, but also feeling maybe a little bit resentful that other people aren't pulling their weight. And actually what's happening is we're just all pulling our weight in different directions. <laughs> um, so you know, sometimes that kind of clarity is really, really helpful to make sure that everyone understands, okay, this is what we're trying to do. Because if we all have that shared understanding, we can trust each other that we're all pulling towards that direction. It also comes from maybe how we lead and manage as well. So in our leading hybrid teams, we talk about the shift from managing people to managing outcomes, the shift from taking control to giving control. And when we do that, instead of having to build systems and things to monitor, we're really building trust. And what that does is it creates an outcomes-based leadership style. So instead of talking about individual actions or measuring you know, people's time and location and are they at their desk and you know, how many meetings are they going to, we're actually just talking about outcomes and impact. So we're measuring what matters, which is the impact. And then the emphasis go basically goes on, it's your choice, how you work so that you deliver the work. So we have to be clear what the work is, we have to be clear about those outcomes, but then once we are, we can then hand over the reins and let the person doing the work decide, okay, what's going to help, you know, what, um, how am I going to work? And what's going to help me to deliver that, uh, what matters here, which is the outcomes and the impact. So we start talking about delivering the work rather than putting in the hours. And essentially, this helps us to bring all of our full selves to work, you know, our boss mode and our worker mode. So our boss mode is the part of us that makes decisions. It's the thinking that we do, whereas our worker mode is the part of us that does the work. And this comes up in lots of our sessions, um, but particularly in our delegate like a productivity ninja session, because what often happens is people go, well, if I delegate something, I want to make sure it's done right. Um, so I will decide what it's going to look like, what you've got to do, and then I'll get someone else to do the doing. And what you're doing there is you are doing all the best boss thinking, and then you're asking somebody else to do the worker mode doing. But if we go back to the picture before with all the post-it notes on our head, what's overwhelming in terms of our workload is often the thinking, not necessarily the doing. Um, so actually, it's when we're delegating as a productivity ninja, what we want to be doing is delegating the decision making, delegating some of that boss mode thinking. And if we're clear about those outcomes, we can then trust that that person will make the decisions. They might not make exactly the same decisions as us. They might do it differently. They might even do it better. Um, but it means that you've got their brain working on the problem, not just their hands. Now, some of us might be thinking, yeah, I like that, but I'm also a bit of a control freak. <laughs> um, what if they don't do it right? What if they overstep? Um, or what if they go completely down one route and then I get it back and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to have to redo it now. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot in our delegation workshop. And that's where this um, little helpful metaphor can come in handy. So you've got to love an egg based slide, like to <laughs> illustrate some subtle point about delegation. We also have a cake slide in our delegation workshop, but you'll have to come to that workshop. To see that. <laughs> <laughs> but here we're talking about setting boundaries in terms of, um, you know, if we're clear about our boundaries, if we're clear about, um, you know, here's the bit where you can make decisions, and I will back you. I trust you to make your decisions within this, whatever you choose, I will back you on that. The, the white is basically, if you move into this area, check with me first, and we agree, we can agree a way forwards. And then the frying pan is just don't go there. Yeah, you don't want to go in the frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> I just worked out the punchline of that illustration. Exactly. Um, and, but actually, when you're clear about that, you can trust that that's that shared expectation that you, you know when they're going to come to you, when they're not. But also, if you're on the receiving end, if you're being delegated to, it's really helpful to know where those boundaries are. It's like, great, I know I'm trusted in this bit, and I know this bit is where I need to talk to you about. So there's no kind of mismatch of expectations there. John's liking the idea of delegating some thinking. I think there might be some reallocations of some of that stuff as a result of this afternoon. Brilliant. 
And then we've got um, being clear about comms. So sometimes we don't feel trusted because someone keeps chasing us or someone wants to be copied in on everything. But also sometimes we feel like I, I need to know what's going on. You know, or if I send you an email, I want to trust that you're going to come back to me. And a lot of that comes from the mismatch of expectations when it comes to all the different types of communications we've got going on. And so well, if that feels like an area that's like, yeah, I recognize that, then definitely look into, um, we, we do a session called Supercharge Your Team Comms, which is basically about getting really clear around the rules of communication. What channels do we use for what kind of communication? What's the expectation? What's the response time? Because when we have those things clearer, you reduce a lot of that ambiguity that has the potential to erode trust. Grace, can I offer a contribution that Kat shared a few minutes ago, but I think it might be good to bring it in now just to sort of provide a background to where you're going next with social trust, because um, we, we've we talked about task trust, we're moving into a different kind of trust in a minute. Kat said, um, when we have trust, it will also foster empathy, mm. allowing leaders to welcome the types of discussions that are typically taboo in the workplace, mental ill health, bereavement, etc. It fosters inclusion and a holistic approach to well-being and is therefore and therefore happiness and fulfillment at work. So so that kind of deeper, more relational social trust. I, I know that you've got some things to share with us about that. So I wanted to bring Kat's thought in there, which has had a lot of love in the chat as well yeah. since it was posted, including from me and Elena. Yeah, absolutely. Kat. And that's that's essentially what social trust is. It's like if we trust each other as people, if I know that you are for me, that you have my back, then we're in collaboration, we're not in competition, yeah, we're in this together. It's that kind of social trust, yeah, and that is really, really powerful for exactly what you've said there. Um, ways of building social trust. Well, you know, it was a really basic thing. Spending time together socially really, really helps. Just getting to know people. Um, I've always found that you know, as a team, because us ninjas, we work remotely, but whenever we're able to come together, particularly when we're able to meet maybe some of our HQ team for the first time in person in like, I almost say 4D <laughs> rather than 3D. <laughs> you know, How many Ds do you want? <laughs> yeah. I always feel like that's when I always notice that after those meetings, everything works better. Yeah. Like we understand each other better. There's less stress, less anxiety. There's, you know, there's, it just works. And some of it isn't even conscious. It, it almost works as a, at a subconscious level. I think a lot of this comes down to one of our sessions called Influencing Persuading. There's a, a, a stat there that we share around how 93% of communication is nonverbal. You know, a big part of that is body language. And a lot of that is lost when we're like kind of just limited to these little screen boxes. So when we're able to spend meaningful time together, that helps to build rapport, it helps to build relationship. Um, and you know, and, and that, that goes a long way to helping to build social trust. I am pumped about our own two day gathering next week, which oh, yes, will be the first time we're all together in person since just before Christmas. Um, and yeah, of course we have some work things to talk about, but a large part of that time spent together is going to be just about being together mm -hmm. in a social, personal, real kind of way. And it must never be underestimated how much that stuff is important as well. Uh, Megan's just, uh, I haven't read this one, but I'm going to assume it's it's apposite to what we're talking about now. Megan says, we're a newly formed team from two sides of the business and we're getting together next week for a workshop day. I think it's going to make a huge difference. There you go. I was right. I knew Megan was going to be thinking <laughs> on the same lines. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, and, and so like finding opportunities to do that, to come together physically, but also finding opportunities to weave some of those social conversations into our everyday work. So maybe at the start of a meeting, maybe engineering some water cooler moments. Um, so we have, um, you know, we have a, a wormhole thing that we do every Wednesday where anyone who wants to at a particular time, we can just all dive into Zoom together and just work on our own stuff that we can see each other. There's a little opportunities. It's not quite the same as all being physically together, but it still oh. helps. Um, so we have things like that. We have town halls where we can air stuff and, and, and kind of discuss things and bring things out into the open, maybe have some of those um, more kind of tricky conversations or air what we call our stinky fish, which is like, this is something that's niggling me. Like if I keep it hidden apart, it's going to keep stinking. But actually, if we bring it out, we can you know, work it out. That's something that's quite noticeable about how we use the meetings we still have synchronously at TP. 
in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of really good asynchronous stuff going on on Slack and sort of transactional things happen there, but the relational, the, the consultation, the collaboration, the social, a, a large proportion of the meetings that we still have in real time are more focused around not just that kind of process, but that kind of attitude as well. Um, you know, I was in Wormhole this morning with Elena and we both vented a little bit about stuff that was tricky this week. And, you know, it, as well as getting our own stuff done for now, we gave each other a bit of peer support as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And all those things help to build, build trust. Somebody mentioned vulnerability earlier. So um, Truth Tuesday, I think, has helped us in terms of building vulnerability. It's basically every Tuesday, somebody starts off a Slack post that says, it's Truth Tuesday, how are you doing? So it's kind of an opportunity to share what's going on in our work and our lives, or our well-being thing, how are we feeling today? Um, and there's been a lot of sort of vulnerability and sharing there. Pippa um, says, what size is your team? Um, the extended UK teams are about, about eight to 10. Like some are full time, still a part time. We have similar size operations in uh, Western and Northern Europe. There's a team in Australia, New Zealand, uh, and team in North America as well. Um, so yeah, I, an interesting one. Is it is it a bit harder the bigger the team is? Well, maybe the team is then a collection of smaller teams as well. So the same dynamic is going on. But I won't I won't get too much in the way of Grace's thoughts. But yeah, that's a good one, Pippa. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you know, some of it is as, as well, like, do we have permission to be fully human? Or do we feel like we have to hide some of these things? Because um, the more we have to hide it, the more bandwidth that's going to take up. Um, but actually, the more we have that permission to be fully human, um, then actually that also helps to build psychological safety and trust in each other. I love this quote from Brene Brown. So leaders must either invest a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings or squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to manage ineffective and unproductive behavior. It's like those fears and feelings are there. The things that can erode our trust, they're there. <laughs> but if we try and kind of keep it hidden, it just festers. Whereas actually if we can tend to them and deal with them, then actually, um, yeah, that, that's much, much better. Meter so in the chat is uh, channeling their inner Renee Brown as well. Almost simultaneously, there was a, an on point comment yeah. Uh, we, we talk about work as being the small part that drives the important stuff, which is family, home, social life. Yeah. We tend to talk more about how we are, mental health and things to look forward to. So I think it's exactly that kind of being vulnerable, being open, but building that kind of social capital and strength as well. Um, Carol, I have seen your technical question about what we use internally for comms, but I'll, I'll maybe do that as we get towards more the closing Q&A rather than doing that now. Yeah. And actually, you know, one of the biggest opportunities for building trust isn't just like how do we create this perfect environment where we build trust it's actually how do we deal with stuff when what i call the shit hits the fan <laughs> you know when uh, when we get it wrong when things go wrong when we find ourselves in conflict you know those are actually those feel like the the, the, mo the danger moments in terms of when trust might be eroded but actually they can also be real um, opportunities to build better trust because let's face it, we are all human. We do get things wrong. Um, there's a story that I tell in our new session called Struggle, which is based on my book, which I'm going to do a little plug for. Love <laughs> it, love it. Poised to be shown on camera at a moment's notice. <laughs> oh, yeah, so the book is Struggle, the surprising truth, beauty and opportunity hidden in life's shittier moments. We can keep it clean. If your organisation wants yeah. me to keep it clean, we can talk about shiftier moments. It works just as well. Um, but one of the stories I share in that is about a time when I got something wrong. And you know, I, I, it was a simple mistake, but it had large knock on effects. But one of the things that really shone through in, in how Elena, who's on this call, responded was, you know, I, first of all, I felt able to go, I made a mistake, I messed up, and rather than try and shift the blame or hide. But also Elena's response to me was, Hey, Grace, you're human. <laughs> because it's a really vulnerable place when we make a mistake. It's really, really vulnerable. And even if we go, yeah, I know we all learn from mistakes. And, you know, we've got that rhetoric in our heads. And it still feels really vulnerable. And so to have someone meet us in that mistake with, hey, you're human. It was a place where I felt like I was falling and then I felt like I was caught. Um, so how we respond to each other in those times of mistakes 
can be real opportunities for um, for building trust. Um, and you know, maybe responding to the person before we dive into the work of like, how do we fix that? But also responding with that sense of empathy to go, yeah, we know we're human too. We make mistakes. Okay, we're with you in this rather than, oh, what did you do? Um, so definitely that. Um, there's another story that I tell, which I'm not going to tell now. So you'll just have to you know, come to the workshop if you want to hear the full thing. But the idea of um, you know, actually responding in a way that's very counter to how we would normally expect. We normally expect to be punished for making a mistake. But um, yeah, there, there's actually a story around someone who sent his team member flowers when they made a mistake. And that was to say, look, I know how you feel. I know you're going to be gutted about this. And these flowers are there to remind me how very rarely you make mistakes, but also remind you that if we don't make mistakes once in a while, we're not playing big enough. Um, and so this reminds me that actually sometimes our best response, our most powerful response to somebody being vulnerable is just to say thank you. You know, if someone has shared something vulnerable, if someone has opened up about a fear, to say that first of all, rather than like, okay, what are we going to do about it? Just start with thank you. Like, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, because when you're thanked for it, it's, it just tells your lizard brain, okay, I'm safe. It's okay. I haven't created a danger here. I haven't created a threat. So this is something that Graham often says is people first, work second, always. And I think that translates into how we respond to mistakes or how we respond to situations or even like the beginning of a meeting. Let's check in with people first and then dive down to work. Um, but also let's prioritize people first, work second. So if something has happened, if something's going on with somebody in, for, on a personal front, let's you know, let them know, okay, we've got your back. This matters, you matter. The work will, you know, will, will kind of look after itself or we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. And this is something that I think we've said to each other a lot, I think productive at various times, it's gone round, round the room as it were. It's um, not just one way, it's, it's definitely gone between us. We've all had times when we've said this to each other and we've all had times when we've needed to hear it from each other as well. And I think that's very much part of what creates that sense of psychological safety. Definitely check out the Human Not Superhero session on YouTube where Elena and I both talk about times where for different reasons we each needed to really receive some people first, work second, always love as well. Yeah, definitely. So I hope that's been useful. Um, I was saying to Lee earlier this morning when we were sort of prepping for this session, this could be a lot longer. This probably could be a whole session in itself, but we just wanted to give you a flavor, give you some tips, but also signpost you to some of the other workshops that we run that um, dive into some of those areas in more depth. I know our official time is up in about four minutes, is it Lee? Yeah. <laughs> um, Lee and I are always happy to hang around for a little bit of unofficial after show. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, we'd love to take any questions that you have, but also, Anything you want to share about how you build trust um, or anything that you've heard today that's making you go, yeah, yeah, that's, I think, the next marble I want to pop in my jar or somebody else's jar. So while some of those come in, I'll start by answering Carol's question. Carol asked us, what do we use as tools within Think Productive? So um, primary internal comms tool is Slack. Um, it was in the before times, but it, we found it particularly useful um, now is a lot more flexible hybrid remote than even we did before. And we were almost that kind of team before. Um, we use email internally very, very sparingly. It's mostly for customer communications and big formal like product policy, like code procedure announcements that need to go across company. Um, Zoom is our main internal meetings platform. And in terms of what do we use for day to day task wrangling, I think we're a slightly different beast in the sense that semi deliberately, we all as team members use something individually different. So we've got things like Todoist, Trello, Asana, OmniFocus, Remember the Milk. Um, and it's also it's part of building up our own internal knowledge base about the kind of tools that that we might be called to help other people as well. Um, but yeah, all that good stuff um, very much falls under the, the category of the weapon savvy ninja. Uh, and again, more, more on all those kind of things 
um, on all the other resources that you can be pointed to. <laughs> Grace, um, if we do one or two more, and then if you want to wrap up formally with any final words on the official finish time, and then as is traditional, we usually just hang out and mm. chew stuff over until um, <laughs> until um, until it's yeah. time to go. I did spot uh, the question about what was that communication workshop again. So that yeah. feels like a good kind of segue into look, uh, Supercharger Team Comms is the communication workshop I talked about. So that, um, you'll see you can find out all about our different. Um, workshops on the website, but Supercharged Team Comms is the one I talked about there when I was talking about kind of communication styles and, and sort of how we inf that was influencing persuading. So when I was talking about the body language, that was from influencing the persuading. And the other three workshops that I mentioned was leading hybrid teams, delegating like a productivity ninja, and struggle, which is the new workshop based around my book. Don has thrown us one at the very last minute and has recognised that it's probably a biggie. But also on Dom's mind is, is the process of recovering from broken trust as well as yeah. and refilling that jar or even reassembling that jar, perhaps occasionally. Yeah. Um, I think that fears and feelings thing, I think is a probably a good place to start. So when there's been broken trust, is he's finding a way to come together and, and talk openly and honestly about, hey, here's how I feel. This is what happened. Um, and also sometimes separating the feelings from the thing that happened because what often happens is something happens and we attach a meaning to it and then and we feel you know and that's how we feel about it but to be able to kind of then start to unhook it to go yeah this is what happened and this is what i meant by that this is what i took as a meaning this is how it you know and actually being able to unpack but it takes vulnerability to go into that space because it's it's like it, it's like rather than i'm going to go into fight and flight mode it's like okay i'm going to put down my weapons and be willing to talk with you about this to go, okay, where do we go from here? So the, it's almost like you have to invest a little bit of trust in, in order to then, you know, get the ball rolling, gather it up again. It's, um, John has um, recognized uh, that they connected with your um, egg frying pan thing. Mm -hmm. um, rather than worrying about someone, what someone else could do wrong, I'm going to start thinking more about how to shepherd the areas of up to you, let me know, and no go. I even like those three. There might even be three better labels for our for our frying pan than that. Yeah, I think there are some changes happening to our frying pan. Yeah, John, in that moment, you may have become an official part of Think Productive Content. But yeah. There you go. Brilliant. The other two things to let you guys know is upcoming stuff. So upcoming public workshops, again, are going to be on our website as well. Um, so if there are certain sessions where it's like, oh, I'd love it if we all did this as part of a team, but maybe it's hard to get everybody on board first. Can I just join first? Like if you're one of the ninja pioneers in your team, in your organization, come along to a public workshop because you can buy a ticket for that. Um, I think Hayley is are running both of these um, coming up in September. Um, and then also we've got project management one in October and uh, six weeks to Ninja, which Graham is running um, mm. starting in November. The original OG Productivity Ninja. Yeah. <laughs> and as well as all those paid uh, public workshops, this is an ongoing series of the free workshops. We've done these pretty much every month since lockdown one. That was our way of putting a little bit of productivity and well-being love in the world. So head to the playlist of all the past ones that you'll find on the Think Productive YouTube channel. And again, on our website, you can book your free places on the ongoing series. We've got ones for the next couple of months already up there and more going to be added too as well. So we'd love to welcome you again on any one of those. And Sally has said a very nice thing about our double act. So that's a lovely way to, to end <laughs> a mid-afternoon session as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, our official part of the session is um, is up. It's over. Um, we'll hang around for a little bit longer. So if anyone wants to hang around in the room with us, ask us any more questions, feel free to. Um, but for those of you who have other things in your diary, you um, thank you so much for joining us and um, and good luck in putting this into place. Have fun with it. Let me know how you get on. Excellent. Thanks very much, everyone. There's now a flurry of thank you chat messages, which is super lovely as well. Some really great contributions from attendees this afternoon, I thought some really good, reflective, insightful, quite profound ones as well. I always enjoy following you on these little ones. Grace, you always take us to some interesting places as well. Thank you, John, Sasha, Sally, Jenna, Carol, Oliver. Lots and lots of great stuff from everybody today as well.
Uh, Francoise, uh, yes, there will be a recording. So all of these sessions have been recorded. Um, give us about 24 hours and this one will plop along with the others um, on our YouTube channel. So just search for Think Productive on YouTube. Um, and then there's various playlists uh, of different kinds of content that support some of our workshops. But one of the playlists uh, will be the Productivity Ninja Skills sessions. And this one will be added there along with about 20 others that are already there. So I'm library grown there. Yeah, if, if you're still here and this is the first time you joined us for one and you're thinking, oh, that was quite good. What else have they done? Um, we've done surviving e-well, overwhelm, fixing meetings, delegation, kindness and win the workplace, human not superhero. What else have we done, Grace? Loads. Saying no. Yeah. Saying no and feeling good about it. Um, tackling the anti-procrastination beast, all that kind of stuff. So similar to today, they're often like ideas drawn from one or more of our formal workshops that we would bring to you in the workplace, uh, but maybe pointed at a particular sort of question that we'd like to explore a bit more or to, to offer you some, um, some additional ideas as well. John's about to subscribe to the YouTube Ooh. channel. That's amazing. Mostly yeah. we're just happy for visitors, but subscribers <laughs> is <even> better. <laughs> and you know, and, and the ideas for these um these particular um sessions, these bite-sized sessions come from you as well. So if there's a question you want to ask us, just send it through. Um either come and find Lee or myself um, on social media or um you know, or the main Think Productive channels, or just drop us an, an email via our website. Um, and just say, you know, I'd love to, I'd love, I'd love you to take on this topic um, as a Ninja Skills Booster. And um, who knows, we may well take you up on it. Elena, I know you're still on the call. Can you drop the uh, hello at contact email into the chat so people can know where to find us? Um, and uh, or reach out myself for Grace as well. So Grace at thinkproductive.co.uk and Lee at thinkproductive.co.uk as well. Mm. Final comment coming across the line from Colin. What resonated with me was when there isn't trust, I do the self-promotion and also too many activities. I actually find myself saying, but I've done all the emails. I've never realized. Ah, yeah. So this, this feeling that you need to overperform to survive in a low trust environment. You did touch on that one. Colin's um, sort of connected to that idea as well. Yeah. It, it almost takes away people's safety to acknowledge their human not superhero when there's not enough trust around mm. lovely connection across the different taster sessions as well cool well we're still here and there's still a dozen of you lurking which is absolutely lovely um so if you are there just because you forgot to close the tab then hopefully you'll remember that but if you have got more questions put them in best way to find us john um both grace and i and all the other team members are on linkedin uh, we have reasonably unique names so you won't find like a hundred grace marshals on linkedin and not know which one it is and yeah uh, connect with us don't you, you don't have to follow us we're not celebrities just <laughs> <laughs> we certainly are not talk, yeah. <laughs> um, or reach out uh, or obviously check out the website and the YouTube channel if you are curious as to what else do we do for people then the whole training range across the sort of conceptual space that we deal with mm -hmm. um, is that Elena's, Elena's RMD our boss she's yeah. not here because she didn't trust us I hasten to that <laughs> she, she's here because she's just really into this stuff like the rest of us as well so um so, and yeah. she's super fast with the cut and paste. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Oh. Okay. Um, some of you may have small people arriving home from school soon. I know I certainly do. So I've got about another five minutes, Grace, um, to chew the fat. Mm -hmm. uh, and if not, that's going to be my hard out. You can see why we schedule our free tasters from 2 to 2.45. <laughs> <laughs> got to do this stuff in family-friendly hours as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other thoughts now, Grace, as you've taken us through that journey as our, as our current person that's been doing the deep thinking about trust? I think it's just just the thought is, is to continue the conversation. So, you know, and often these are things that we notice kind of on our own. But actually, if we can start that conversation with people in our teams, within our organisations, yeah, that's a really good way of then just opening things up. Um, because I think when we feel low trust, it feels like, oh, things, you know, either someone's against me or everyone's against me. And often that's not the case. 
often we're all just kind of feeling a little bit defensive and it's our defensiveness that rubs off um, or rubs each other the wrong way so maybe find ways of maybe introducing some of this into those conversations and if you feel like actually it'd be really helpful to have an external facilitator come in you know come and chat to us because it could be that one of our workshops could be a good conversation opener and um, for mm. you team and or for your organization the thing i've been reflecting on the last couple of days as we've rehearsed this is this was always really critical but i think the need for thinking about this stuff has been accentuated not just the last two years but i think the last six months as organizations are trying to find what the future is going to be like so people are trying to work out what's the stance for remote and hybrid and what does it mean now to work with more distributed slash digital teams on a permanent basis you know it's, it's not a temporary thing anymore you know more people looking at four day week perhaps as a separate thing or in concert with their hybrid strategy as well and all of that is tied in with lots and lots of things that came uh, from today as well um i should probably do my duty and mention that if you're interested in four day week and you want to learn about how we do it um, head to the relevant page on the Think Productive website. Um, and Elena and Jess, who are our own two sort of internal leads on four day week, um, would be pleased to help you talk and think about that kind of stuff as well. There's a big UK based trial of four day week going on at the moment, and we are part of that as well. I think we may have a topic to trust coming in from John. Building trust with more distant than my team internal stakeholders would be a really valuable topic. Interesting. Okay. And I can see Elaine has been busy in the chat, sending people links and all sorts of stuff as well. We didn't even know you were coming, Elena, and it's been fantastic to have you here helping with the stuff that I was supposed to be doing, but I just haven't been able to resist getting involved in the chat. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. Um, I think we might be done then in that case. I suspect the remaining 12 people just don't want to leave before we've stopped spouting on. So maybe it's that. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, well, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and yeah, let's um, continue to keep in touch. Let us know how you're getting on in your ninja journey and do get in touch if there's anything that we can help with because we'd love to. Thanks very much, everyone. And see you all on the next one. Cheers.